everybody who to, welcome to everybody who's joined us here today. Um, we are here to talk about Lawrence Sale's new book, Accidentals, um, which is being published by Impress Books. Um, so Lawrence um, studied French and German at Oxford before becoming a teacher. Um, he taught in Kenya for about four years before coming back to England. Um, he is now a freelance writer and poet and has published 13 books of poems alongside two books of essays and has also edited a number of poetry anthologies and has won the Cholmond Lee Award for his poetry. Um, Accidentals is his latest memoir. It follows on from his previous book, Sift, uh, in which Lawrence describes the riches of his child childhood life in Exeter in post-war Britain, as well as covering his parents' travels before the war. Accidentals um, continues on from this and covers a very large range of subjects, including capsizing boats, lighthouses, and his love of Candide, which is all beautifully interspersed with his daughter's illustrations and his own poetry. Um, with Lawrence today, we also have Martin Sorrell, who is a writer and translator. He studied French and Spanish at Oxford and has worked in the French department at Exeter University for most of his career. Um, he has translated many works, including Verlaine and Rimbaud for the Oxford University Press, among other French and Spanish poets. Um, and his book, Paulette, uh, which was also published by Impress Books, is the story of his mother, um, who was born in France in 1916. Martin tells the story of her childhood, growing up in rural France, her time in Spain at the start of the Civil War, and finally her move to England. Um, so that's our two speakers today. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of uh, the session. So if you have any questions you would like answered, please type them out in the little um, uh, message box that you're all currently telling us your locations in and we'll pick a few to answer at the end. Right, um, over to Martin and Lawrence. Um, well, I'm going to start well first of all and most obviously welcome to all you invisible presences and thank you for joining us um i'm going to start with uh, an extract from one of the essays which um may come across as nostalgic uh, but um i put it in the context that without the wonders of modern technology on which my hold is rather tenuous this event simply wouldn't be possible tools of the trade the kind of school desk I have in mind is something you might now find in an antique shop. Extremely heavy, probably made of oak, it incorporated a seat with a back to it, as well as the actual writing surface. It seemed a bit like a self-contained vehicle of some sort, an impractical kind of sledge. When you lifted the lid, there was a cavernous space with plenty of room for books and stationery, though under a slew of these, you might well have found an accumulation of litter, sweet and bubblegum wrappers, an old marble or two, the remains of last season's conkers, twists of wood shavings from a pencil sharpener. At the front edge of the desk, just beyond the lifting lid, there was a slight indentation designed to hold a pen with, on the right, a white china inkwell in which to dip it. The pen itself was a simple wooden shaft onto which you clipped a metal nib. New nibs worked best when wetted with spittle before you began to write. From today's perspectives, such equipment is almost as remote as Babylonian clay tablets, but it isn't so long ago that a post of some importance among school children was that of ink monitor. He or she, usually easy to identify by the amount of ink that had worked its way into the pores of the skin, was responsible for checking the supply of ink and ensuring the ink wells were full. Inevitably, a fair amount of ink found its way onto clothing and into books. For tidy work and exams, blotting paper, blotch, was essential. It was treated as a rare commodity and doled out parsimoniously, one pink or white rectangle per pupil. It used to remind me of historical films in which, presumably in an attempt at accurate detail, the writer of a letter would shake a large pepper pot filled with sand over a just completed letter before rolling up the parchment. No blotch then. School ink had a character of its own. Blue-grey in colour, 
which had to be reconstituted from powder, a process akin to the miraculous liquefaction of the blood of a saint. If diluted too much, it would issue in a pale hue, which looked already faded and quickly faded more. Good news, at least for mothers trying to remove the stains from school uniforms. Given the limitations and drawbacks of the system, the acme of ambition was to have a pen of one's own. Not a holder to dip, but a real fountain pen. One birthday, I was given what I most coveted, a marbled, shiny green Conway Stewart, quite small, with a gold nib, and along its side, a little lever which you pulled out at a right angle to the barrel, before putting the pen into a bottle of ink, and slowly returning the lever to its original position, to draw the ink up into the reservoir. <coughs> the box it came in also held a matching propelling pencil, which struck me as terrifically stylish, especially with the pink eraser it harboured, together with spare lengths of lead. But it was the pen that meant most. In time, the Conway Stewart was succeeded by an even grander pen, a grey Parker 51, which lasted for years. It had an extra fine nib that you could only just see at the tip of the streamlined rounded barrel. Nowadays, I'm the happy owner of a lovely waterman made in Paris, black with a gold band and clip. Right. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence. I can uh, remember my own Conway Stewart, actually. <laughs> and our family doctor had a Parker 51. I think doctors always had Parker 51s in, in, our, in our youth. Um, if, if I may, I'd like to start with the cover of, of the book, because um, it's so striking. And um, I've got a question. I particularly want to ask about it. Um, I'm trying to hold it up. Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful. God, I'm not doing this very well, am I? But you can. Uh, ah, that's fine. a bit better. Mm. You, people have got the idea. That's Erica's seahorse up here, which is a, an exquisite drawing of the said animal. And Erica is, of course, uh, Lawrence's daughter who I believe is freelancing now as an artist specializing in this kind of uh, drawing. Is that, is yes, that that's right? right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, as an illustrator, just so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let me start with this um, very interesting title, Ac Accidentals. Um, I know that as a term in uh, music, which I'm I think I know less about than than you do, but I know enough to know that it's um, uh, it's it's uh, a variation on a key on on the on the main the, the main thrust of uh, the the piece being uh, uh, you know the the piece of music. Um, so if, as it were, your chapters your essays are. Um, variations on a the theme. Tell us about the theme that you see at the heart of this. That's a, a, a really mean question. It's by it's not it's by, mean. It's like it's like being asked what now what about all these things you've left out? But you're absolutely right about accidentals. Um, yes, it's a, a shift from the main key or the key signature, um, usually temporary in nature. And I suppose it appealed to me because um, I had settled for something which wasn't just a straightforward linear narrative continuing the memoir of childhood, um, but for something that moves or could move in various directions and shifts, um, and therefore was able, as you mentioned, to cover a wide range of subjects and objects. Um, I suppose in any biographical writing of any sort, um, the, the groundswell is uh, time going on. but. Um, what links these things, disparate as they are, is that they were all causes of lasting delight. They're all instances or occasions or places or objects that have continued to demand headroom um, as the years go by. And I suppose a lot of them therefore relate to the time of life which uh, seems particularly apt for discovery. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
you know, that point you made towards the end there about um, um, these moments of, of delight. Yes, I, I see these um, the whole book as a sort of affirmation um, of things that have been of um, uh, of greatest sort of moment and sig significance to you. And I, I, I presume that that is, in a sense, what what holds the beads together on the on on the string of your uh, of, 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 the, of the book. Um, yes, the extract you read, from Tools of the Trade, um, if I may say, I find that a, a lovely example of your method. And I know you're, you're slightly worried that um, we might see this as too nostalgic or, or the, the risk of nostalgia. No, I, I see this as um, partly about what has been lost, including um, Generally, I suppose in the in the book, the, the loss of of, um, of Europe. I don't know if, uh, how thematic that is, but what has been what has been gained as well, and that's what I, I suppose I mean by affirmation. Do do you, do you, do you see yourself as somehow sort of balance between loss and gain? Yeah, very much so. Yes, and um, I mean I'm aware that the context, the present context of our current situation makes that seem a bit like news from another planet, um, quite mm -hmm. apart from um, any sense of um, time passing or nostalgia. Um, yes, I mean, even the one on tools of the trade, the essay on tools of the trade, I'm quick to acknowledge the virtues of our present methods. Um, you know, gone are the days when one would have to um, uh, apply a razor blade or a tipex yeah. to the paper or risk fretting a hole in the paper um, with a rather hard eraser and that's absolutely wonderful and as i said at the outset without without um the, our present technology this event would just be impossible yeah um but certainly affirmation um one of the problems though about that i found as i was um, writing the book was it's very easy to or would have been easy I hope I've avoided it um, to fall into the trap of doing a kind of sort of desert island discs approach and, and in a sense making a list of one thing after another and there were some um, subjects that I found it, it, it's very difficult to choose as it were because there was so much crowding in I mean I suppose the one of the prime examples is um, is the essay on music. I mean, and even just when naming a composer, as soon as you name one composer, even if it is J.S. Bach, um, you immediately, th and then you think, well, what works by J.S. Bach? And again, the names of the possibilities crowd in, and one has to both avoid making a list and um, take the plunge and uh, risk um, selection on the grounds that these are um, some amongst many, not the only ones. Yes, well, they they, um, they are, uh, to, you know, to, to my mind, they they are um, varied and and diverse. It's, it's quite quite a kaleidoscope. And picking up on that, may I um, make a sort of just a, a personal choice here? That I, for, for me, I think the the your poem Bluebells is the standout poem of the uh, of the interspersed uh, the poems that you've interspersed among. Uh, amongst the the prose, and I see that as a, as as a, an excellent example of your um, poetic method. Um, as Lara said in her introduction, that you, you've done many many novel, um, sorry, many many um, uh, collections with uh, with with blood acts uh, principally, um, and I've always been struck by the the um, the sustained focus that you bring the minute focus focusing down all the time on um on your particular subject very often from nature isn't it um yes and i thought this was this was wonderful that you you are trying to define if i get this right you're trying to to pinpoint the ineffable the the color of the bluebell and a bit like it reminded me of Beckett, actually. <laughs> Every so often, start again, and you yes, have another yes. approach, and you come at the bluebells, and um, in from various angles, and it's it's a wonderful combination of um, minute observation, um, grasping this carpet of flowers that you actually can't quite grasp, but it seems to elude you right to the end. Um, and I thought that really, um, for people you know uh, who don't know 
your work. I thought that was a, um, a, a tremendous example of, of, of your poetic voice at its most acute. Um, I don't know if you <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> no answer to that. <laughs> yes, I know, but I, I, I'm delighted that you choose this just for um, you phantom the very present listeners. Um, this, this is all unrehearsed. I, I had no idea that Martin was going to um, select Bluebells, but I'm absolutely delighted that he has. Um, it is, yes, I like your idea. I mean, how flattering to have any sort of even tangential connection with the mention of Beckett, but um, it's, I suppose, um, it's about something that's not only ineffable, but was entirely elusive. And it's particularly the color of bluebells. I say at one point, their color is almost. And um, it is almost, it's almost this and almost that, but never quite nailed. Um, and um, I'm interested you described as a poem. I, it's, it's a kind of prose poem, and there are uh, a few of them in the book. Um, and uh, it's about, uh, well, I suppose going back to Beckett, it's, it's almost like um, a paraphrase of that wonderful remark of his, um, next time fail better. Fail um, better, yes, then, yes. And indeed, I was aware that when I, this business of start again, when I, when I try and, um, and I suppose that's in a way very much the method that um, occurs sometimes with, with poems that, um, that um, start again, maybe um, time for a new draft, a new worksheet, but also yeah. it's, it's a kind of um, intensity of focus that, um, that I think you come back to again and again. Um, yes, I'm, the, the bluebells, they really are extraordinarily elusive as a colour. It's very interesting to me that, um, that it's very rare that you see, for instance, a painting in which the bluebells are anything other than slightly sad. And that isn't just a matter of colour. The way they exist, as, to use your word, in a carpet in the forest, the way that they um, lose something of that magic, uh, in the same way that they, when culled or when put in a vase or even in a, in a town garden, um, and in the same way they they lose focus, they, they kind of baffle the eye. If you look at them, you've got one of these intense um, vistas beneath trees going away, and it is quite difficult to focus on them beyond um, the limit of a few yards. Yeah, I like the way, yes, you, you kept coming back at it from different angles, trying, trying to get a new, a new metaphor, a new, a new um, comparison, and um, one that, that struck me because it was so unusual and so right is that um, at, a, at a certain angle, it's like a spillage of petrol. Yes. Isn't that right? As you pick out yes. one particular color from within a petrol yes. puddle. Yeah. Uh, yes, the iridescence of The iridescence of, of it, yes, yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Uh, also, the, um, there's also uh, in my mind was that, um, that um, ultimately elusive goal of the, the German romantics wrote about, Die Blaue Blume, um, the idea of the, uh, yes. the blue flower. Which you mentioned, that always you? slightly escapes you, yes. And uh, yeah. I suppose that is a minor example, of, to go back to an earlier question of yours, about the European angle of the book, mm. um, well, um, particularly at the moment, yeah. and, um, yeah. before the gunboats get deployed in the channel, uh, it's very good to reaffirm um, that sense of, of of being part of Europe, not when people yeah. talk about going into or coming out of Europe, one wonders on what continent they think we live. Yeah, yes, which leads me to the um, the fourth extract that I particularly wanted to to pick out, if I may. And I suppose I'm looking at time. We're we're doing all right, aren't we, on timing? Um, that your last. Um, uh, essay, Timepieces and Tongues, also um, struck me very forcibly. And I felt that it, it's exactly the right place to put that, um, that essay at the, end, at the end of the book. Um, you talk about the various timepieces that you own, don't you, that have been passed down to you. Um, but you, it sort of leads on, as you often do, from the particular to the more general, um, the passage of time, age, aging, I suppose, and I was particularly interested, leading on from what you've just said, 
about your position between, as it were, two languages and two cultures. And I thought that came out rather, um, um, well, forcefully and, and slightly sort of, slightly enigmatic, slightly troubled. I, I don't know, is, is, is your position between the German language, the English language, I mean, inhabiting both, but in a sense between both, something I know from French and English, um, same sort of, of course. Uh, yeah. Is it um, is 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 that something that uh, runs thematically in your thinking? Yes, it is, and and to be uh, again to use a word of yours, affirmative about it, it's something for which I'm profoundly thankful. I mean, to have access to uh, German literature and French literature is, um, is just wonderful, and um, uh, uh, I consider that a great. Um, gift to be given by circumstance, by the accidental nature of things. Um, it also uh, saddens me that um, a country that gave refuge to my father when he left Germany in the 30s, um, now more and more seems to treat the teaching of languages as um, so not quite surplus to requirements, but useful only in so far as it's um, one element in the idea of employability. Um, and that loss of the, I mean, of course, liberal humanism was something that was um, enjoyed by the privileged, and uh, that was one of its great limitations. But uh, at the same time, that loss of the enjoyment, the humour, the flexibility, the range of languages uh, seems to me a great cause for sorrow. Uh, as far as feeling troubled or enigmatic about it is concerned, um, I think that is uh, a bit of a puzzle in a way. It was one of the lessons I learned from, from writing this book um, was that I was even more of a Francophile than I thought I was. And uh, it interests me looking at my, my, my father was a, as a painter, as you know, Martin, and looking at his work. Um, for a German, he had a, a, an acute sense of the Mediterranean and the South mm. um, rather than for instance, the pine forests of the north. And uh, I find myself in exactly the same position. Give me the olive groves rather than the mm. conifers any day, <laughs> uh, and the Mediterranean rather yeah. even than the Baltic, although that's very beautiful too. So um, you and I perhaps have that in common. I mean, you even more closely in your um, links, your familial links with France and your mother and so on. Yes, 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 possibly so, yeah. Um, and possibly time to finish now, I think. So can I leave you with this, that um, I was struck in, in that essay, um, as, I've, as I have been all along, about um, uh, your father, who seems to sort of haunt your books, or uh, perhaps not haunt, but sort of flit in, flit in and out, and I can never quite grab him. And I want to know, I'm, I closed the book wanting to know more about your father in, in all of this, um, but, you know, as the, sing, the single item, if you like, that, that, that I would want to, um, to know more about. So I wondered, is that perhaps your next volume? Um, well, in a sense, it's all my volumes. Um, I mean, join the club. I'd like to know more about him too. Not that he was um, in any obvious way um, evasive, but circumstance, accident, just took them apart. Um, they had this wonderful life um, of bumming around Europe before the war. Um, and then um, they divorced when I and my twin were um, about three. And I suppose I saw him less than a dozen times after that. And um, with great enjoyment when it happened. But it was, he was a commanding absence, really. Yes. And I often tell the story that at his funeral, um, uh, some German relatives I'd never met I said, we've got these spoons that uh, we think you ought to have um, because they belong to your father and they belong to your father's mother. His mother also was a commanding absence. She died at the age of 24. And they handed me not six spoons, but five. And uh, it's just mm -hmm. that sums it up in a way. There's always yes. that element of, of commanding yeah. absence. Yes. And regret. I mean, I would love to have. He was taught by Paul Clay at the Bauhaus. I only yes. knew this. I found this out uh, a few years ago, quite recently, from someone who had seen Clay's on the cover of two of my books uh, and wrote to me. 
about it. So yeah. um, it can he continues to be a very yeah. lively haunting. Yeah. But I would like to read a book by you called Commanding Absence. <laughs> so I, I, I await with impatience. So um, <laughs> so we're about eight o'clock. So would that be a good moment to stop, Lara? Um, yeah. <laughs> it was lovely to hear you talk. Um, about that book um and uh now for anyone if you have any questions um please post them in the uh the chat box in the bottom right corner and we can answer them um we've got one from from jane who is asking if you could both say a bit more about the franco-german border in F exeter franco-german exeter ah. Is that Richard? <laughs> uh, oh, yes, it looks like it is. You must be yeah. here. Count. Hang on. After so, you, Martin. <laughs> yes, I'm not quite sure I understand. I'm actually I'm, sure I don't understand. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 yes, uh, the border. Do you, do you mean... <laughs> I don't actually know what. Sure. Um, what Richard means there. Well, I mean, we'll with, see if he um, tries if he to write in again. Clarify yeah. anything. But there is a question from Graham, which says, "Did you ever consider writing the Good Hatter's Guide to France after a certain road trip?" Ah, oh, yes. That's a, oh, believe me, it's been very difficult not to write, Graham. Um, yes, this was a, a holiday which we. Uh, slept on um, very primitive camp beds um, in uh, bus shelters and uh, little <laughs> shelters that you find in the middle of vineyards. Um, I think that it would have to be a book that somehow uh, had a certain delicacy in alluding both to the graffiti and the odour of some of these bus shelters, um, but uh, it was great fun. Um, I've managed to resist so far, Graham. I see there are two requests for a bit of um, your reading bluebells, Lawrence. Would that, would that yeah. fit in? Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Um, I won't read all of it because it is... Um, it's long, isn't it? But, it's, uh, it's about five pages. Um, and it's... Um, I mean, again, not unlike um, many poems, it's it seems to me to be um, a journey of partly of recognition and partly of discovery. Um, and above all, an attempt to... Um, I'll, I'll read the, from the start and, um, and read a page and a half down to the first injunction to myself to start again. Bluebells. From multiples, they merge to a single infusing colour. Beyond 15 yards or so, the focus is lost. Almost is their colour. Almost lavender, almost mauve. And they escape under cover of such approximations. A wash, a tide. You could drown here beneath the bursting beech buds in the almost blue slack water of the spring tide. Still a sworn statements, not a stem amongst them moving. Birdsong quiescent, attendant. How can flowers create such a hush? To the trees hundreds they bring their thousands, held as one washed soul. Close to they invite the eye only to baffle it in their mauve middle distance. What could you say you have seen? You have come to essay what is wordless, priceless, Imagine them gone with no memorial but birdsong. Is this what ineffable means, inexpressible or unutterable? Slants of sunlight gleam on the slender green leaves, the green without which the almost blue of the bellflowers would be quite different. Is this also what die blaue Blume infers, the mystical flower, not a rose, that can never be found and plucked? 
How can a crowd be so still? Even when a light breeze gets up, the dominant impression remains one of immobility. They stand to attention in the sunlight. Almost a deep lilac, not quite mauve, close to a milky mid-purple. None of the above exactly. After a time, after a distance, the eye takes them as red. They tip over the wood's inner horizons. More than the sum of themselves, they state all that can be in full flower. They have nothing to prove. If they trap the mind, it is on their own terms. Not invulnerable, but always singing. Their tender salad is stronger than the grey and green trunks of the beech trees that stand everywhere amongst them and rise far above. It would be good to think them invincible. It would be, it would be good to think they are safe in the acres of paper mast. Start again. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, we have another question from Fokina, uh, who says, you mentioned subjects crowding in and not wanting a list. How did you decide on what to include? <laughs> Very good question, yes. Um, I think that it depended on um, the vividness with which they had stayed with me and um, the sense that I would never short of death shed these things and all want to. And that's, I suppose, one reason why the sea, which we haven't really mentioned, um, is such a strong element. Um, I was amused when Erica produced her lovely illustrations. And I don't know, incidentally, how working on such a small scale she manages so skillfully to get the texture of things. But um, her um, illustrations uh, of the eight, uh, a number of them um, play to that theme of the sea and the maritime, whether it's a seahorse or a lighthouse, an anchor or a boat. Um, but uh, the sea is a prime example, really, of something that uh, is a sort of in a, to me, <laughs> sort of absolutely ineluctable element. Um, partly, I think, because as a writer, it's so protean. You look at the sea and you think, yeah, that's what it is. And maybe you even conjure with a metaphor for it. And you look away and perhaps even in a pleased fashion, write something down. And you look back and it's quite other again. It's always inventing new versions of itself. And that element of newness is enough both to keep one from hubris, but also to take one back again and again to trying to capture it. Rather, not unlike the bluebells, the spring tide there, even there, the tide infiltrates to the land. Fakina, I, I, I hear you not talking uh, <laughs> with a gentle accusation that I, I haven't really answered your question, but uh, it's the best I can do. Um, well, um, it looks like Richard has yeah. clarified <laughs> and is asking about the dynamic dynamics of your friendship, I guess, in, in terms of the Franco-German border in Exeter. Does that clarify the question at all? Well, yes, it does. At least we, we don't need passports quite yet to talk to each other. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, long, uh, from my point of view, long ago, but in fact, not as long as would have been relevant because we turn out to have been at university together uh, or in the same university rather than together. Um, and in but, the same lectures, quite possibly. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and that, same rooms at the same time. I yeah. wish I'd known, Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, well, it's mutual. But um, when I, a long time ago, um, I edited a magazine which called Southwest Review. And um, when I was editing Southwest Review, review um, I think that was when I had some submissions and some translations from Martin, and they were they were terrific, absolutely wonderful. And um, that um, initial um, excitement at seeing his work has stayed with me. And uh, you mentioned his skill and his range, indeed, as a as a translator, whether Rimbaud, Apollinaire, um, Verlaine, 
but um, that's been a great source of uh, enjoyment and pleasure. And um, your turn, Martin. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I was going to say that. Yes, I I, I, I saw Richard's second uh, sort of clarifying quest question, and that's exactly what I thought. That's 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 how I remember it. That I submitted it. I'm not terribly sure which poem it was. It may have been a Rambo, um, a short Rambo poem. And to my delight and 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 amazement, um, uh, Lawrence um, took it. And um, I'm ever grateful for for that because that uh, sort of opened the way for me. It just g gave me that little nudge of confidence um, because I'd been doing I'd been doing some translating. I taught. French poetry a lot at, uh, at the university um, and started translating but without much confidence and by the way without much encouragement in the way the way the uh, university was set up or the university world was in those days it didn't constitute serious work to be translating and certainly not translating as Prévert <laughs> yes <laughs> yes you're a wonderful um, translator of Prévert, I think. Yes, I, that, that's right. I, I, I began to have some fun with, with some, mm. you know, um, slightly, um, you, you know, the sort of playful poets such as um, as Prévert. But um, getting into Southwest Review did did set me up and and launched me. And my good luck was that um, translation studies became serious um uh, or be, was taken serious were taken seriously in the university world just when um things were opening up for me and i was getting um bits and pieces um published um again i think another one in southwest review and so on and our friendship developed from that and i think there's always been though we haven't talked much about it in in any sort of deliberate terms um, the connection in that we are both, as it were, half half English, half half our half our being is in this country, half is in another, and I've um, um, I've always found that both uh, interesting and um, nourishing, pr productive, as Lawrence has said, but also troublesome, and I don't know if. Well, Lawrence sort of didn't see his father often enough, but I remember that my mother um, was constantly in love and out of love with 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 England, with with Britain. It was it was almost in the same sentence, the same breath. There was this kind of ambivalence, and um, it, it, I just wonder how general that is um, for people sharing 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 their cultures and um i sort of obviously in terms of the the um immigrant population that we have in this country that that i think is a sort of um fascinating issue and um, it's it's one thing being as close as germany or france to this country um difficult enough though though it, though it was but when from your you're from another from the other side of the world and you're on this shivering island which is about to become a kind of tea tray floating in the atlantic i think that frankly the way um never mind mustn't get political but um then you know i i, I do feel for for that um part of society frankly so to answer richard's question that that's the the you know the dynamics are, are quite sort of deep and unseen in various ways but the, the these connections that have held for what 40 odd years is it now lawrence something like that yep indeed yeah. yes do you talk in your sleep martin he said Person. i'm awake i'm thoroughly awake honestly no no honestly I'm not Hello. Are you talking in your sleep now <laughs> <laughs> i'm you sorry i thought that's what you meant habit. no yes, like it was always my dream to sleep through the lecture i was giving but i could never it was like circular breathing in um, in saxophone players. I can't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Sorry, this is getting very facetious. I was asking about, I was asking about um, talking to sleep because I, um, my poor wife and family, not only do they have me talking apparently quite a lot during the day, um, 
but um, they have to put up at night, with, they have to put up with me talking in French and German quite frequently. Um, so I wondered whether this, uh, this particular uh, liminal aspect affected your sleep as well. No, no, I, uh, that's interesting. No, I haven't, I haven't noticed that. Um, uh, you know, people have often asked me if, you know, how is it to be bilingual? You know, how fascinating, how lucky and so on. And my answer is always, no, I'm not, I'm not bilingual. And I'm not terribly sure who is, to be honest. I think I'm dominantly one, but, you know, the dominance is, is less pronounced uh, than it would be in, 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 in monoglots, as it were. But um, so uh, my dominant language has always been um, English, even when I don't know if you have a, a, any similar experience. Um, I lived in France when I was about four, through difficult circumstances. Um, without my father, talk about absent fathers, when I came back, brought back by my mother from the south of France, Toulouse, where we'd been for the best part of a year, I was introduced to a strange man on the on the on Victoria Station platform who picked me up and started saying incomprehensible things to me. And my mother said, <laughs> you know, embrasse ton père, but you know, but kiss your father. And I had no idea who the bloke was. Um so um this is all rather roundabout but to come back to your question no i can't recall dreaming in 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 french um I, the dominant language and presence and even now more so even now i think now that i've retired from teaching and french is it comes in and out a bit it's, it's even more pronounced now well to skirt the same sort of border i would recall um, one of my father's rare visits uh, to um, my mother, my sister, myself, we would watch in awe. When he arrived, he would bow and kiss my mother's hand. Um, <laughs> and there was this extraordinary sense of, of ritual and of odd formality, but also of great tenderness. And I never heard one say a cross word about the other. My mother blamed the failure of the marriage and the war. Um, and uh, of course it's true that in one sense um uh, i owe my uh, english birth to hitler and my english education to franco uh, <laughs> because my parents had settled in spain and then had to leave because of the civil war so richard there are plenty more borders for you but i also agree entirely with what um with what Martin was saying, that uh, it's not a question of being bilingual. I mean, in a way, it's as approximate as, as the act of translation, that uh, you have to accept that, in a sense, unless you knew the historical, emotional weight of every word, you're onto an approximation. Um, and uh, I think the same is true in our sense of skirting. I don't even know whether it's skirting nationalities, it's skirting what you can distinguish as attitudes distinct from one another in different places and peoples um, and then in a sense rather like you meeting your father at victoria station a very alarming story um it's trying to make sense of it isn't it and trying yeah. to, don't you think and trying to trying to unify it to bring it all together so yeah. I think, mm. yeah yes i think that you know that that must in my case that must have been much a, a really significant moment um there's other factors as well because he was a thoroughly english sort of man but there was a sort of um, remoteness about our relationship that never, never really um, got any closer, except in in his letter writing to me, when uh, he did try to be much more, much more tender. But he, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I was digressing. I hope I hope it's all right with our with our listeners. But um, I, I always remember that with some affection that he never knew how to sign himself. Dad wouldn't do. Um, so what did he do? Keith wouldn't do. So he'd scrawl something which looked halfway between Dad and Keith, and it was in illegible. <laughs> he must have. He must have very, very carefully practiced how to continue being being ambivalent and evasive. I think. Isn't that interesting? Because because my father had almost. I mean, he had the tenderness. Just what you're saying. A tenderness in the very rare letters, but uh, they were tender. 
they was masked by almost total illegibility. They had to be forwarded to my mother, who would put in her guesses above the flat lining that was his handwriting, and then return them. But um, yes. in a sense, and, and, and the formality that you mentioned, I mean, isn't that partly generational? That no, I think we, it is. We were brought up, even in our situations, we were brought up in the spaces between adults. And they were clearly mm. defined and they were mm. in some ways i think we put an awful pressure on our kids demanding that we're their friends and know all about them you know um the, it was quite clear that this was the space marked be on your own this was the space marked mm. lunch is not yet ready um you know yes. they were don't you think it was far more yeah. I, codified in that way <laughs> this just remind me can i can i follow this with an anecdote people don't, don't mind my father was also my teacher at, at grammar school and I was the only pupil um, there who had a parent on the staff. It was very unusual God. in the 50s and it was really rather awkward. He was my housemaster as well. He was my French teacher and my housemaster. And at the, <laughs> at the end of term, he used to fill in how um, Sorrel had done in French this <laughs> this this term <coughs> as a housemaster how um, how Sorrel had had behaved and helped around you know and, and supported the house and he'd write this in a report which would then be taken he would then take home <laughs> and I suppose he would read and the next day he'd turn the page over and write the parents' reply to the housemaster <laughs> from the French master. <laughs> yes, dear housemaster, I'm very delighted. I mean, I'm interested to hear what you say about Martin. <laughs> so we've got, I've still got one of these reports with this. And I think in a way, very humorously, that sums up both the sort of joy and the stupid, you know, the sort of hilarity of, of this and this situation. Also, the the the, the very real awkwardness about about certain divisions. I mean, to get back to a serious point, there, childhood in my memory, um, full of full of divisions, frankly. Um, but that's another story, and we're not here for that. In fact, we've rather had our time, I think, haven't we? Um, yes, we are. We are coming into the end of our time. So thank you for everybody for your questions. And thank you, you two, for all your, your answers um, and everything. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that you can currently buy accidentals um, from all the major places that you can buy books. Um, but if you order directly from uh, the publisher in Press Books, you will get 10% off accidentals and you will get 20% off if you buy it with SIF, which is accidentals predecessor. Um, you should have all the links in the flyer that hopefully most of you received. Um, but if you didn't, to get it from the uh, from Impress Books and to get the discount, you just need to email orders at impress-books.co.uk. Um, and that's how you can access it. Um, and hopefully you will get your coffee. <laughs> it's a very beautiful book. Lara, may I just also thank you for um, coming, coming between us so um, elegantly, um, like a rose between two, um, I hope not entirely curmudgeonly thorns. But, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Lara, indeed. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Martin, thank you. see you at bye the bye. next frontier. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for almost being there. <laughs>